So what we're going to do now is a meditation on identifying self-cherishing personally. And we'll start with looking at the definition from Tipton Jimpa's book on mind training, the compilation of various mind training texts. And we'll kind of look at it intellectually, let yourself be with it intellectually, you know, sharpen the edges of it, get it really clear in your mind, and then we'll shift to experientially. So I'll put the definition on the screen for you to look at once again, and we'll just spend a minute kind of staring at it and going, huh, <laughs> right? Even though it's something that we're all pretty familiar with intellectually, I think it's good to just kind of make sure it's nice and tidy in our mind. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, we'll just start by having our motivation revived, breathing meditation, then I'll put the definition back on the screen and read it to you. And then I'll click it off and walk you through some contemplations to sit with. So that's what we'll get up to next. And so first starting with nice straight back. However, you can have a straight back, whether it's well propped with cushions, whether it's self-supporting, whether it's even laying down on the ground, do what you gotta do to have a straight back. And have a few deep breaths just to settle for a second. Breathing through your whole body, just coming back into a grounded way of being. And let your attention go up and down your spine, releasing any tension you find surrounding it. Bringing a sense of a very strong and stable back with a soft and receptive front with nothing clenched or held in. Just settling. And then just revive your motivation, refuge. Bodhicitta, thinking I go for refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. through the practice of the perfections, through the practice of meditation, may I become enlightened in order to benefit all sentient beings. Let it refresh and reconnect. and bring that groundedness and that motivation 
to a brief meditation on the breath before we do analysis, just allowing surface distractions to settle. Shift your focus to breath. Just a simple and direct focus. Returning to it when you get distracted. And as thoughts arise, you neither agree with them nor disagree with them. Just allow them to arise and dissolve without giving them any particular focus. Unhook yourself from your train of thought. Plant yourself on breath focus.
no need to reminisce, no need to anticipate. Just be with the breath. and gently sharpen your focus specifically to the sensation of the breath at the nostrils where the air comes and goes. If you prefer, you can shift it to the belly where the air makes it rise and fall but just become more specific and pointed about where you focus the breath. Starting to bring more strength to the meditation. Fewer distractions.
And now we shift to analysis. And we're just going to remind ourselves first intellectually, then experientially, what is self-cherishing? So you can just listen to the definition or if it helps, you can read it. But reminding yourself that self-cherishing is the deeply ingrained thought that cherishes the welfare of your own self and makes you oblivious to others' well-being. It is one of the twin demons that lie within our heart and source of all misfortune and downfall, the other being grasping itself. So the antidote to self-cherishing is bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, the primary Mahayana motivation to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. This main mind with two aspirations. But in order to apply the antidote to the specific problem, we need to figure out what it is. So cherish is the welfare of your own self. Cherish, explore that a little. Makes a little bit too precious, too important. You are precious, you are important, but not in such an isolated, narrow way as self-cherishing sees you to be. Self-cherishing actually brings obliviousness to others' well-being. Makes us not even notice or not care. So just clarify what it is first. And then still intellectually become more specific that self-cherishing in this context is referring specifically to a negative aspect. There's a positive aspect, which is looking after yourself, taking care of yourself, being kind, practical about your own self. That kind of good self-cherishing is not objected to. It's this negative self-cherishing that makes us self-centered and selfish or self-conscious and neurotic.
It can be irritable or anxious before it's even a noticeable type of an affliction. It's just a rumble under the surface of agitation, a subtle type of me first, or what about me? So start now by thinking about the experience of self-cherishing generally in the world or generally in the people you know. Before making it too personal or too confronting, just think about examples of how self-cherishing plays out, maybe politically, policies that say, us first, the way those policies alienate whoever is other, the way it makes allies into enemies, the way it creates suspicion, the way it ignores interdependence. Just thinking globally at first, what do we know about the impact of self-cherishing? The way it sets up me versus them or us versus them. Thinking about places in the world that are so habituated to us first, that also have some sort of fear of sharing or collaborating. The way it makes those places isolated. The way it makes them harder to relate to. because such places are not obviously cherishing others or holding them most dear or seeing them as precious, then those very other places start to resent, start to separate, feel less warmth, harder communication. The whole negative ripple effect of us first.
and then you can switch and think about the benefit of a country or a place whose policies actively cherish others, who reach out, who collaborate, who find ways to communicate. You can think historically or even what's happening right now in various places when connection is actively cultivated, the benefit of that, when interdependence is recognized. And now shift to thinking about the impacts of self-cherishing in a group in which you know the members, whether it's your workplace or your family or your friend group. Just try and think about the way in which self-cherishing is at the root of conflict. Maybe it starts as one person's behavior from self-cherishing, but then it triggers someone else's self-cherishing in response. And then there's a whole ripple effect of everyone feeling misunderstood or disrespected or not valued. Try and think of some situation in a group you're a part of where self-cherishing was at the heart of the issue. And try not to get yourself triggered or sucked into a story. Try to be an objective observer, looking at how the dynamics played out in the conflict and how every harmful action was driven by an undercurrent of self-cherishing. Be like a scientist of your own history.
And take that same example and imagine what would change if one or two people got over themselves. If one or two people shifted into altruism that was deep and genuine, wishing the greater good. And those couple of people stop taking all the drama personally, didn't feel right or felt wrong, were just wanting to increase the health and well being of the group. What might change? How many people would be needed for there to be a groundswell of change? positive domino effect. Would one person be enough to start? And what about if nothing changed except for your own individual attitude towards the drama? Would it be possible to maintain peace of mind even amongst all the chaos of other people's emotions? If you shifted into altruism, into cherishing others, just internally, privately, And what is it like those times that you are fully engaged with the group, connected, caring about them, but not so invested in outcomes, not so tight about your version of what's best, when you've been able to step back a little bit, but not so far as to become disconnected or disassociated.
Just try and remember a time when you've been connected and engaged without sucked into the drama. Reconnect with your ability to do that. And now shift scenarios to something very personal and private. When you're alone, think of a day when you're all by yourself, no one observing, no one judging, and try and see if you can find a version of yourself alone that is full of self-cherishing and contrast to that aversion of yourself that is with less self-cherishing. So on a day with a lot of self-cherishing, there's going to be distraction and dissatisfaction at the heart of it. There's going to be a push and a pull of too much, not enough. Too much, not enough. But what does that look like for you as an individual? Is it very, very busy or very, very slow? Do you forget to eat? Do you eat too much? Just what happens to you on a day where self-cherishing has taken hold? but no one's observing you other than yourself. you have a lot to say to yourself about how life isn't good enough or how you are not good enough? Or do you kind of blank out and become spacey and vague? Doesn't really matter which, but try and cultivate a self-knowing. What is your version? And then compare it to a day where you have less self-cherishing 
but you're still alone by yourself, unobserved, but you feel lifted into some sort of altruistic, greater good mentality. A day that you're grounded, self-aware, but not self-absorbed, not self-conscious, just mindful. Try and find a version of when you're like that, healthier. And then think through the power of all of this analysis. May we deepen our self-knowing and actively cultivate bodhicitta. And may that bodhicitta develop into full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Jancho sam chorim po shem ma ke panam ke gyochi ke pan yam ba me pa hi gone gondu pawa sho toni dawarim po shem ma ke panam ke gyochi ke pan yam ba me pa hi gone gondu pawa sho and you can relax your attention. Okay, does anyone feel comfortable sharing a little aha moment or a moment of confusion while it's still fresh, while we're still in the same position. Yeah, Francois. Thank you. Um, I just realized um, doing this meditation review that um, even, even when I was being uh, generous, I was self-cherishing. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a big realization for me because there were moments where, especially with my little girl, she's 14 years old, she's going through a tough time and I'm helping her out with, with things. But at the same time, I was, I'm getting agitated. I'm thinking, you know, how long is this going to keep going? There's, I'm not grounded. So it's quite, this was quite enlightening for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a good sign if you're embarrassed <laughs> during, a, during a meditation. It's always a good sign because <laughs> it means you're touching it, you know. Um, if you don't feel related at all, then, um, you know, there's a little bit of resistance or something, and that's worth exploring too. But it sounds like, yeah, you're touching it. You're getting the nuggets. Yeah, so embarrassment is a good sign. <laughs> Did you feel any, um, I don't know, kind of, oh, no, <laughs> feelings? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. For me, it was just very, very obvious. Um, the difference when I'm, I'm grounded and I'm self-aware and I'm enjoying, you know, like generally I'm feeling 
whole and when I'm being when it's all about me how tight I am how agitated I am how self-conscious I am and physically it's it's it it's very very obvious that it affects mental it affects my mental health it affects my physical health the tightness and everything so it's very very obvious yeah thank you again yeah yeah look it's um these are the things that then we can feed into our mindfulness you know to just be mindful is not enough we have to be mindful with what are we mindful of <laughs> right are we bodhicitta mindfulness are we you know aware of what we're doing with the agenda of are we catching ourselves when self cherishing wants to grab a hold and co opt our best intentions or fuel our sense of self righteousness or push a sense of agitation are we mindful enough to catch oh i'm slipping again because if you can catch it when it's just small that's enough to diffuse it you don't even need an extra motivation if you just have bodhicitta mindfulness and you notice self cherishing is starting to creep up the light of your focus makes it go oh never mind you know, it's, it's beautiful that way, how the mind works once it's been conditioned by these knowledges, you know? So what you're touching right now in meditation and in study, you then bring or you're bringing to your daily life. And it means that you'll have better self-awareness and you'll still slip, of course, for ages, but it's like less often, less strong, or you'll catch it sooner you know, you're the same as you ever were, but it's less often, less bad, you know, et cetera. And uh, whether you notice a physical cue, like maybe when your self-cherishing is really latched on, you get floppy or you get tense. You know, it doesn't matter which, but if you know which version you have, that can be your little mindfulness bell that goes, oh, oh. And back to bodhicitta, <laughs> you know, and it just falls apart. So, you know, it's, uh, you can start to trust yourself, I guess, the more you study, and then your mindfulness during the day is qualified or imbued with that study. And then you see it kick in just in your little choices in a day. And then you're building this confidence that actually your wisdom can grow. Yeah, and your heart can open and yay dharma and you know, then you keep showing up to stuff and you keep building on stuff and it becomes this really like invigorating process where self-awareness it is embarrassing, but it's also absurd and connected to the human condition. You know, and then when other people are being uptight or obnoxious or they're being lazy and vague and disassociated, or when they, whenever form their self-cherishing is taking a hold of them, your immediate thought is more, oh, I know what that's like. Yep, I know that place. And you really feel affinity rather than aggression. And you still might say, oi, stop it. But it's coming from a place that's not so agitated yourself. You know, it's really like, oh, just like me, you do that, I do that. Oh, it's so embarrassing. Afflictions are embarrassing. Whew, you know, not what is wrong with you, <laughs> right? You're like, yeah, I know what's wrong with you. It's the same thing that's wrong with me. Yeah. Other thoughts while it's fresh? Yeah, Heather? I had the... Um... I used to, I used to work for Congress. And so when you're trying to get um, a bill passed, you, they call it whipping votes when you're trying to get people to vote for your bill. So I sort of was laughing to myself that when I start getting self-cherishing, it's like, I have to whip the votes. I have to make sure everybody agrees with me and is voting and I'm gathering votes to be on my side. And and there's nothing even happening. It's just me. I'm just, are they on my side? Are they on my side? Are they on my side? And so that sort of made me laugh. And then the, and then the sort of opposite of that is I have two very young nephews. And I think that I am my highest self when I'm with them. They're four and six. And, and I can just be so spacious and that it is so important that I be my best self so that I don't harm them by trying to make them feel guilty or getting angry or all of these things. And it, and it just was sort of like, it's very natural to shift to this um, not self-cherishing attitude 
because I'm focused on them, but because, yeah. you know, at some point be, kids become adults and then my expectations raise along with it. And, you know, so I just, I found all of that sort of very interesting as I was kind of being led through this. Yeah. 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 It's good stuff. Yeah. It's nice to have that <clears throat> visual. <laughs> Who am I lobbying? <laughs> Who am I whipping votes for? Uh, Helen, do you want to add? I unmuted. Yep. Um, yes. my, for me, I was squirming in my seat completely towards the end and just going, oh, okay, because my mind just flips. I think I have all of them and my mind every second is flipping from one to another. And the, the one that got me the most was when you're sitting at home and there's no one else around there and how big self-cherishing is at that time. That's what made me squirm the most because... If I think about self-cherishing, I'm always thinking when it's me around other people, but actually it was much stronger when I'm by myself. So that was my little insight today. I'm glad it's, you know, I spend a lot of time alone. So that one comes naturally to me as well. It's like, wow, I just ruined my whole day all by myself, <laughs> all by myself. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Look, it's and you have to have that lightness, right? Otherwise, you, you start to, I don't know, collapse inward into depression or radiate outward into defensiveness. And it's like, you're just like, oh, we're all absurd, but it's not me, you know? It's, you know, it just kind of, <laughs> it's not me. It's just the human condition. And I, I always try and think about what is the opposite of compassionate words in my head. Like when I don't have compassion, what do I say in my head to other people? And I usually say something like, I just don't understand why they dot, 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 or I just don't understand why they don't dot, dot, dot. And the more self-knowledge you have, the more you understand why they or why they don't. And then compassion comes so naturally because you're like, I know that place. It looks different for me, but I know that place, you know? So then your judgment just collapses. And you still can find it aggravating, but it doesn't aggravate you. You know, it doesn't steal your peace. And you also feel more connected to the human condition, you know, and you, like kind of a, a less isolated feeling. So, you know, again, when you're by yourself, you can feel by yourself connected to humanity or by yourself alienated from humanity. And alienated from humanity isn't them throwing you out it's you removing yourself you know and I, I often think about this if I've been alone for many days and then I go out <laughs> and you're out amongst the humans right you know when you are out amongst the humans with self-cherishing you have an edge to you you know you're bumping into people you're having awkward traffic situations you know, you're having kind of awkward conversations with shopkeepers, you know, it's just all kind of, uh, uh. maybe even the radio annoys you, and then the silence annoys you, and everything annoys you, right? And then on a day when you're out in public, you're by yourself, but you're with people, and self-cherishing is not driving. It's like, you know, a flock of birds or a school of fish, and you're just kind of in the flow, and you're not bumping into anyone, either energetically or physically. And you feel sort of happy connection with the human race and people are obnoxious and you find it amusing and people are sweet and you find it inspiring and you're just kind of connected, happy, still alone with others, but not with a feeling of isolation and alienation, you know? And so I think that these kind of like memory review reflections really do help us catch ourselves then in the present and going forward. So we just got to keep coming back to what is it like for me or what is the most common version for me? Because then I'll catch that sucker more often. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts before we have a little quick break and then another verse? Yeah, Margo. Unmute, please. Unmute. Sorry. Perfect. No um, problem. No, 
I just find, you know, I really liked the image of the happy hostess, Yentin. You know, <laughs> for, for me that comes easily and I really like that because it helps you. You're amongst people but you forget yourself because you want everyone to have a good time. That's my happy place, you know. Yep. Whereas being by myself, I think I found that harder to relate to and I do spend time by myself quite a lot but I don't know that I'm aware of what's going on when I'm by myself. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it's a, a benign disassociated state. And sometimes it's a really unfortunate disassociated state. I think the question to ask yourself is if you're by yourself, not particularly aware, and someone interrupts you, what's your response? You know, if you're full of self-cherishing and someone interrupts your aloneness, then you're annoyed, even if it's someone you like, right? You see the phone and you're like, Ugh! right? If you're not full of self-cherishing and something interrupts you, you're just like, hmm, you know, you're just kind of curious, right? And so sometimes when we're in a little bit of a, a fog of not particularly mindful, but not in a horrible way, just kind of not totally present, ask yourself what would happen if this moment was interrupted? <laughs> would I react well or less well? <laughs> I always think of um, one of my teacher's attendants um, is constantly interrupted. Like it's, she's like a hero of coping with interruption. And I just am in awe because sometimes I help her do paperwork or something and people are just constantly in and out of her office, in and out of her email, in and out of her text messages, just constant interruption. And she just is like, yes, <laughs> yes. And so patient. And I, after a while, I would lose it. I'd be like, enough, <laughs> you know, but she just is in the flow with it. And it's such an admirable trait to be interrupted and manage it well, while keeping friendly, healthy boundaries, but at the same time, not turning them into barriers and kind of agitated, get away, you know, knowing yourself well enough to manage that. All right, so just kind of pop it in the hopper, have a little think. Um, we'll have just a five minute leg stretch and, um, and do the final part. So quick leg stretch, and then we'll come back in five minutes. <laughs> 